Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in encouraging employers to pay the real living wage. Minister Richard Lockhead. Good progress has been made in promoting payment of the real living wage in Scotland. And last month saw living wage accredited employers increase to just over 2,700, which is proportionally five times higher than the rest of the UK. And this means that some 55,000 workers have more wages in their pockets due to employer accreditation. And under our reasonably focused Making Living Wage Place scheme, we have seen Edinburgh City, for instance, announcing their accreditation as a Making a Living Wage Place in November last year during Living Wage Week. And our Living Hours Accreditation Scheme continues to grow, with four accredited employers achieving Living Hours Accreditation since its launch late in 2021. Marie McNair. I thank the Minister for that answer. I welcome the continued efforts to help promote a living wage. The Minister will agree that an unambiguous commitment from employers to pay the living wage in recognised trade unions in the workplace is a strong platform to being a decent employer and providing a fair and productive work environment. Does the Minister also agree with me and the STC that this Parliament must have control over employment law to fully be able to embed decent employment rights by setting a real living wage and ending the exploitative use of zero-hour contracts? Minister. I think the member is right, and of course it is very timely to raise this issue given we are in the, just experienced the pandemic and the implications for many employees in Scotland and reflecting on their experiences. And of course we are now facing a cost of living crisis. So now is the time to reflect on the powers this Parliament has to support workers and ensure they receive a decent uh, wage for their, for their work. 85 per cent of Scots do receive a real living wage, but of course if we had employment powers we could do a lot more about that to ensure 100 per cent of Scottish employees get a, a decent wage. Uh, and the other issues that the Member mentions of course could be addressed if we had powers in this Parliament. Thank you. Question number two, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the delivery of the missions of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Over the last 18 months, the bank has built up an operational structure. It's recruited over 60 staff and it's delivered investment commitments of over £200 million to 16 projects across all three of their missions, leveraging in over £450 million of additional private funding. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In light of Professor Ross Brown's warnings on the 23rd of May that the Scottish National Investment Bank will continue to flounder and ultimately fail if its missions remain so broad and incoherent, will the Scottish Government commit to providing the bank with a clear mission to drive high-value high added industrial growth and advanced manufacturing in Scottish-owned firms instead of investments in things like a forestry fund aimed at high net worth clients seeking tax-efficient structures? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the two caveats I would make is that I think all members, if I recall correctly, agreed that the bank should retain operational independence. And secondly, I think, if I remember correctly, that all parties agreed with the missions that were set uh, for the bank. And obviously, as a start-up, I think the bank has done an incredible job, not just building its operations, but also ensuring that that pipeline of investments are going out the door. In the last uh, 18 months, they have made eight investments in the Net Zero uh, mission, four investments in the Place mission, four investments in the Innovation and People mission. I guess one question I'd have to uh, Mr uh, Sweeney is, which mission does he think we should drop rather than adding more missions to it? Question number three, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress towards its commitment to deliver a free laptop or tablet to every school child in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. We are committed to ensuring every child has access to a device and connectivity by the end of this parliamentary term. We have already provided £25 million to councils, resulting in over 72,000 pupils receiving a device and 14,000 receiving an internet connection. We know that a number of local authorities have also invested in technology, and they have indicated that in total almost 280,000 devices have been or are in the process of being distributed to learners. This is a complex and ambitious commitment. We are currently looking at the available infrastructure in schools to support the wider rollout of technology, and we are taking work forward in partnership with the local government colleagues and have convened a joint partnership board with COSLA to oversee the work. 
Myrtle Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her uh, response? During the period of COVID restrictions, we had pupils doing home learning who would have benefited from access to a free laptop or, and, or tablet, and many of them did not have that access. The Cabinet Secretary is now saying this will not be completed as a programme until the end of this Parliament. That means that there are pupils currently in S2 or S3 who will be leaving school without benefiting from this programme. Is the Cabinet Secretary being serious in saying we're going to have to wait another four years before this commitment is actually delivered? Cabinet Secretary. Well, our manifesto was very clear that the commitment was for the parliamentary term. And that's what we are committed to do. And I would contrast that with the recent Tory manifesto for the local elections, which contains no timescales and no commitment for a device for every child. So the Tories had an opportunity and a chance to lay out their alternative. They did not. In the meantime, President Officer, we will get on delivering on our manifesto commitment. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support the mental health and well-being of officers and staff within Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. It's essential that mental health and well-being support is provided to police officers and staff at the point of need, and I welcome the initiatives being undertaken by Police Scotland, the employer, uh, to support its workforce. The Scottish Government has provided funding to the Lifeline Scotland Wellbeing Programme, which provides tailored online resources for blue light responders, volunteers and their family members. And this includes provision of £97,864 this uh, financial year. We are currently considering a proposal from Lifelines for further funding support in 2022-23. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Official statistics indicate that officers and staff within the force have missed over 77,000 days during 2021-22. And the Police Federation have stressed that levels of officers and staff are now reaching critical stage and officers are leaving in droves, uh, Cabinet Secretary. The SNP Scottish Government has handed Police Scotland a further real-term budget cut of 8 per cent. Therefore, what action is taking place to reverse this decline and do all we can to ensure that we maintain, retain and support our police forces? Cabinet Secretary. Well, had uh, Alexander Stewart done his homework, he'd have found out that the reason for the reduction in police force numbers is to do with COP26 and with COVID, both of which have limited the ability for the police to undertake training of new officers at Tully Allen because it was being used for other purposes. The police uh, will tell him that. And he asked what else we were doing. Well, we're going to pay our police officers more than the Tories pay the police officers that they've got control over. We are going to have more police officers for our population than there are in England and Wales. And we are going to impose the Tories' imposition of a 5.2 per cent cut in our budget this year, which limits how much we can do. We are doing the things which help police officers, as opposed to the Tories who have undermined and under-resourced the police in England and Wales. Willie Rennie. Uh, two years ago, one third of officers were saying they were going to work mentally unwell. We have already heard that thousands of days have been lost to work over the last two years because of mental health. Yet ministers said they were very satisfied with the mental health su support that was being provided. This week, when I spoke to Callum Steele from the Scottish Police Federation, he told me the situation was still dire. So when will ministers stop being satisfied and actually get on and be improving the service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I would say that I've mentioned the work we've done in relation to the initiatives that we've already funded for the police for this year, and we'll fund again, uh, we're considering funding again for next year. But uh, Willie Rennie will know also that we have access to Police Scotland's 24-7 Help Employee Assistance Programme, the EAAP, uh, and also the Trauma Risk Management Programme. So it's not the case that we say that everything that ha can be done is being done. Of course, as Callum Steele would also argue, we should continue to look to improve the services that we provide. And of course, we recognise the special pressures which COVID uh, have presented for the police. The police have done a fantastic job throughout the COVID uh, period, uh, and we want to continue to support them. So we're not saying we have done all that we can do. Of course, it's the responsibility of the employer, which is Police Scotland, with the role for the SPA, but we will continue to help them wherever we can to protect the well-being of our officers. Question number five, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I draw members' attention to my register of interest, which shows I'm an owner of a private rented property in North Lanarkshire. And to ask the Scottish Government what the support capacity of Home Energy Scotland was before this was increased by 12,000 households. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. 
In 2021-22, Home Energy Scotland had capacity to provide advice and support to more than 120,000 unique households through more than 400,000 advice interactions. As a result of increased funding in 2022-2023, Home Energy Scotland advisors have the capacity to provide support to 132,000 unique households through 440,000 advice interactions. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And while he mentions the figure increasing to 132,000 unique households, um, the capacity to reach low-income, potentially fuel-poor uh, poor, poor clients um, has not increased proportionally with that increase um, of 12,000. Um, action, I think, this summer is critical with the price cap going up in the autumn. Can I ask the Government if they have written to every group that is eligible for the Warmer Home Scotland um, since the cap went up in the spring, and how many installations the Government expects to deliver from those um, 44,000 calls? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so no, sir, I think these latter points are to the 440. Uh, 1,000 calls or interactions. And it, uh, obviously, it is a demand-led service, and it depends on the needs and the circumstances of those individuals and where they, uh, what might be the best route of support for them. In relation to those who are most vulnerable, one of the aspects that we have been able to augment with Home Energy at Scotland is access, to, um, is access through to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Energy Carers Service, which is a specific service to help those who are most vulnerable, um, who may not be able to take advice and support through telephone or by online services, where the actual care advisor will visit them uh, and provide advice and support in their home. That is uh, particularly targeted at those who are extremely uh, vulnerable in order to meet the very type of concerns which the member has. However, if the member has a particular issue or an experience from a constituent where he believes that we could take further action, I would be more than happy to look at that matter to make sure we are doing everything we can to support households. Fiona Hislop. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that older people will be most vulnerable when it comes to facing spiralling energy bills with fixed incomes, often living in older, energy inefficient housing. And according to Age Scotland, 55 per cent of over 55s they surveyed were unaware of the Scottish Government's schemes to assist with energy efficiency. So what steps is the Scottish Government taking to ensure that there is more proactive targeting of older households in the increased resource being made available to Home Energy Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I am always open to looking at what more we can do to help to promote the work of Home Energy Scotland. The principal way in which much of the work is taken forward is through trusted partners, so whether it be health and social care organisations, whether it be at food banks or our charities or local authorities who provide a, refer a referral pathway into Home Energy Scotland. That is where the vast majority of the referrals uh, come from. And as I also mentioned, we have augmented the support for Home Energy Scotland to provide uh, energy care service uh, support to those who are most vulnerable and may not be able to take advice online or over the phone. But if the member has, again, any specific examples of constituents who have not been able to access services or believes that there is further action we could take to promote these services, I am always open to looking at these matters. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government how it is strengthening transport links to rural areas. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Ambitions for future transport infrastructure investment in rural areas are highlighted in the 45 recommendations contained in the Second Strategic Transport Project Review, or SDPR2. The recommendations included uh, investment in ferry replacements and port upgrades to improve their resilience and reliability. We also intend to consider two potential fixed links in the Western Isles, as well as a link between Mull and the mainland. SCPR2 provides the necessary evidence base required to help secure the future funding of these projects, including those that have the potential to transform the way that we travel in rural areas. Rhoda Grant. Due to ScotRail's emergency timetable, it is impossible for people from Caithness to get the train to attend hospital appointments in Inverness. The reimbursement mileage is woeful at 15 pence a mile and does not adequately cover their costs. How will the Minister ensure that no patient is missing out on health care due to the lack of public transport in the area? 
Minister. Well, of course, as the, the member will know, Scott Rail's emergency timetable has arisen as a result of um, drivers refusing to work on their rest days. I'm very grateful that ASLEF have since recommended that the pay deal is accepted, and of course it will now go to a referendum to members. I have asked Scott Rail to look at how we might be able to reinstate the normal timetable as quickly as possible, noting, of course, that Scott Rail have already reintroduced a number of services. On the specific point that Ms Grant has raised around about reimbursement, I'd be more than happy to address that with Scott Rail and to write to the member with more detail on that noting some of her concerns in this area. Yeah. Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Bus passengers across rural Stirling are experiencing last-minute cancellations, especially on services X10, 38 and 51. First Bus advise there is a shortage of bus drivers. Can the Scottish Government advise what more can be done to address these shortages and other issues affecting the industry? Minister. So there's currently a shortage of HGV drivers for buses and lorries due to the pandemic creating a backlog of testing and training and that has of course been exacerbated by Brexit in preventing people from the EU coming here to work freely. We have repeatedly sought a formal role in determining what occupations are in the uh, shortage occupation list in respect of um, our representations, but the UK Government has denied this. Bus drivers are not included in the SOL list, and I understand the UK Government will be reviewing this later in the year, and we have asked for full involvement in that process. This is clearly causing, though, issues in relation to local and national bus services right across the country. We provided up to £210 million of funding to support bus services during the pandemic and an additional £40 million to support recovery for this year. I have asked Transport Scotland for urgent advice additionally on why so many services now appear to be being cancelled due to shortages and how that service changes are impacting on communities more broadly. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, can I just take the opportunity to congratulate the Minister on her uh, recent marriage? Um, she mentioned funding. Um, the Network Support Grant Plus has been keeping uh, bus operators afloat, particularly in rural areas, uh, but it is due to end next month. Um, and industry experts have said this could lead to a cut of 20% uh, uh, on some routes, rising fares and depot closures. So bus operators are calling for that fund to be extended at its current rate by three months, and that would allow passenger levels to recover. Will the Minister agree to that? Minister. I am aware of the issues that the member has raised, and I thank him for his uh, well wishes. Uh, in relation to the funding, of course, uh, some of the funding associated with the support grants did relate to the pandemic, and it was always due to come to an end at some point. However, I have asked officials in Transport Scotland to see what more we might be able to do to support rural bus services. Question number seven, Jim Fairley. No, I would like to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the continued use of Asialox for bracken control. Minister Lorna Slater. An emergency authorisation for the use of the herbicide product Asulux has been submitted for bracken control for 2022. The Health and Safety Executive, HSC, are considering the application on behalf of all UK administrations, and this process is ongoing. I have spoken to stakeholders directly over the last week, and I understand the difficulties associated with bracken control and the current key role that Asulux plays. As part of these discussions, I have indicated that it is important for government to work with stakeholders to explore options for more sustainable forms of bracken control in the future. Jim Fairley. Uh, to thank the Minister for that answer. I am very happy to hear that the Minister has met with stakeholders and I am reassured she is aware of just how damaging bracken is, not just to the environment but to animal health and for the potential of very serious accidents involving land managers when trying to manage bracken using land-based methods such as bracken busters on challenging hill land. And I have been asked by my constituents to emphasise to the Minister that while the HSC continue with their deliberations and whether they grant the extension, that they will be looking to the Scottish Government to protect their interests, the environments they manage and the health and well-being of themselves and their staff. So can I ask the Minister to meet with me urgently in order to discuss what assurances she can give to my constituents who are in the position of having a serious ongoing bracken problem to deal with and no safe method of doing so other than aerial applied Agilam. Minister. I would be very happy to meet with the member to discuss this important issue and understand the concerns that the member and his constituents are raising. 
I would like to reassure him that in considering the emergency application for the use of Asilux, I have sought out views from stakeholders, including those who currently use Asilux for bracken control. Just last week, I met with the NFU Scotland, Nature Scott, Scottish Forestry and the RSPB to hear their views, and they have all made their positions clear. I will continue to work closely with stakeholders and the other UK administrations to explore options for sustainable forms of bracken control. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move on to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery Mr Max Hegelsberger, President of the State Parliament of Upper Austria. <laughs> 